and we are very pleased to introduce Dorit uh, tonight. And uh, she is a member of the Arts Club and of, uh, she's the chair of our poetry events. But we, the committee, insisted that we do this because she's as fine a poet, I'd say, as, as the poets have been coming in. And we really wanted the world to see her poetry as well. And uh, the world has already noticed she has recently won in 220, right in the, in the middle of the pandemic. She was the winner for the Harbor Review uh, Chapbook Prize. And her, on her collection, it's a, her chapbook collection called Meditation on Purgatory. She was also a finalist in the Julia Darling Prize. She's been nominated for the Push, a Pushcart Prize and for the Best of Death. And with Brookstone Books, she has established the Charlene uh, uh, Kushner Wicked Wo Woman Prize Poetry Prize, and that's in honor of her mother, who was a wicked woman, evidently. Uh, so she's act very active in, in the field of poetry and doing a lot of poetry. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn over to poet uh, to, to, to to Dorian and ask her, "Let's begin," and give us a couple of poems. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you, Michael and Adam for doing uh, his interpreting. I've worked with Adam before and he's so much fun to watch that I get distracted. Um, I wanted to tell you, most people are used to the fact that my poems are in what Marianne Moore called ordinary American that cats and dogs can understand. But this very first poem is not going to be that way. So I wanted to give you the background. Uh, in Catholic land, where I spend a lot of my time, there is something called the St. Michael's Prayer. And here's the background of it. In 1885, Pope Leo XIII had just finished Mass, and he turned around, and he thought he saw the devil and God having an argument. And the devil said to God, I can destroy your church in 75 years. And God said, bring it, go ahead. Well, 1885, when that occurred, plus 75 is 1960. And that was when Vatican II began. So the people who oppose Vatican II to this day will often recite the St. Michael prayer at the beginning or end of mass to let the peanut gallery know where they stand. So it, it's a kind of a harsh and a militant prayer. And it begins, St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. So one day I'm sitting there and I hear this and my brain says, St. Michael, the arch angel, defend us, the baffled. Uh, so I'm going to say the St. Michael prayer for you quickly, and then you will see that I turned it into a prayer to essentially be delivered from emotional pain. But it is a, it is a poem that relies on sound. It does not have a word-for-word -word translation. So here's the real St. Michael prayer. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle, be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. I'm watching Adam and I'm trying not to go too fast for him. Here's my version. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us, the baffled. Be our immense against the pickets and flares of our trembles. May we astute them in our bumbling way. And do thou, O benevolent absent ghost, in a shower of sod, combust what's unwell within us, and all the fevered fearlets that howl about our quarrels, beaking the wounds in our bones. And if beaking the wounds in our bones made you think of crows on a battlefield, you understood the poem. The next one is in perfectly plain American, like I normally do. 
um, except that the title is in Spanish. And my apologies to Spanish speakers because my accent really stinks. It is called Las Doce Uvas de la Suerte. And what that means is the 12 grapes of midnight. In certain Spanish speaking countries, you're supposed to swallow one grape for each strike of the clock as it strikes New Year's on midnight, midnight on New Year's. Um, and I had to do that once. So here's the poem. They were eyeballs, olives missing their martini. They were grapes, cold, green, and lunar. And I had to swallow 12 of them as the clock struck midnight. The baby's Argentine nanny brought them lolling in a white corning bowl. Sure, they would fix everything. The postpartum, the husband packed to leave. The nanny had peeled the grapes to make them easier to swallow. So they were that much more cadaverous. Three weeks before, it had seemed impossible that a baby could exit through the space provided. And now it seemed impossible that these chilly globs could gutter down my gullet. But the nanny was inexorable. And so I tried, grimacing and lip lipping like a nature channel giraffe, an ungainly contraption, an animal so awkward that one couldn't imagine how it lived. Michael, do you want to ask something here or do you want me to go on? Michael's not talking, so we'll go on. Um, everyone wrote a pandemic poem. I hope this is one of the least objectionable of the pandemic poems uh, because it's where we're coming out on the other side. It's called, If Nothing Else. If nothing else, we didn't die. If nothing else, the old dog and the older furnace limped gamely. We saw each other fat-cheeked and blurred on screens. We mostly kept our jobs and every morning persuaded ourselves to do them by reciting the admonition, what else would you be doing with this day? If nothing else, we took drives on city streets that were empty, past concrete offices whose windows were unlit, and imagined ourselves submarine explorers skirting the remains of sunken ships. If nothing else, the overthrowers pushed not quite hard enough to topple the wobbling blocks of our government. Then two snows came in February, precise as appointments. If nothing else, we saw one more year of crocuses poke their heads up like green girls wearing purple construction paper crowns and their unknowing smiles didn't entirely fill us with fury. Yes, Dorit, uh, I, my, I was unmuted before, <laughs> or muted rather. Anyway, this one is a, quite an interesting poem because if you're listening, you probably have spotted, but this is a poem about the pandemic, right? But yep. you never mention pandemic in it, and in a year where every poet in the world has written a poem about the pandemic, you've taken an angle that's a bit different. Uh, you've said, by the way, if nothing else, it repeats like three times or four times, so it creates sections in it. But uh, I really like the idea that, that, that you, you, you didn't even say pandemic. And first time I read it, I didn't know what it was about. And then I read it again. I said, hold on, this is the pandemic. So is that accurate? The, the obligatory pandemic poem. Yes. 
but I like the if nothing else because then then it's sort of you you bring down the idea that you're going to give us a pompous reading on it. You know, it's just it's just <laughs> that nothing else happened. This happened. Uh, I I wanted to go back one more poem, the previous poem about the olives. There, uh, a real event in your life or or an imaginary. I really did have to swallow those 12 grapes. It almost killed me. <laughs> okay, give us a couple of other poems. Two more. Okay. Um, this is called Higher Mathematics. If my mother was the numeral, my father was the superscript, a necessary multiplier of the numeral's beauty and vivacity, but smaller and off to the side. Or maybe he was her denominator, holding her up the way a Thanksgiving table holds up dinner, displaying it proudly, waiting for it to split. Once in the garden, my father asked me, do you know what happens when your mother loves your brother? She hates you, I said, not even looking up, math is easy. And what happens when mommy loves me, he asked. She hates Mike, I said, kicking at a weed. And that clever girl, he said, smiling, because I got another answer right, is what we call a zero sum game. So I'm an old fashioned poet. I actually have these on paper, not on my phone. This next poem actually uh, got written as an apology to Terry. A lot of you know Terry because I'm always like blurting out stuff to her. And I know she's like looking at these emails going, why'd you tell me that? Um, so I asked myself, why do we have to say these things? Why do we blurt stuff out? And I remembered the Greek myth about the guy who had a secret and he couldn't keep it anymore. So he dug a little hole next to the river. So this is my poem in honor of blurters, outers, blurter outers everywhere. I understand the guy who dug the hole, whispered his secret into the creekside mud, the way the word for it can be a seed stuck in your throat that won't let anything else up or down. If you so much as part, you'll cough it out. Even here, as you kneel alone in the muck, someone will see you gag up your tiny bit of truth, no matter how you scrape with your fingers to cover it. Already, you hear them laughing with your donkey ears. And if you don't remember the uh, myth, the secret he was telling was that the king had donkey ears. Yes, in fact, I did the homework there. It's it's uh, Melanthus, I think, is the and and the king, uh, uh, Apollo uh, was was displeased with him and gave him donkey ears, and his his uh, barber knew about it. But he wanted to tell him, but he'd be killed if he did. So he told it to a hole in the ground. And then it came out next year, it, to all the plants knew it. So that's, it was kind of interesting that the donkey ears really was consistent through there. Uh, so the other thing I saw was when I looked back on the previous poem, I really love that one, the higher mathematics. The, 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 because for what I found in there was a sustained metaphor all the way through the mathematical metaphor but also it, all the human interactions were still built in around it. And uh, you, you still come to a zero sum game, but the denominator and, 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 the, and the, the idea of the uh, superscript uh, and what a superscript can do. And you're using that as the way people interact with people. So I, and that's, that's something that I, I enjoyed a lot about it there. Uh, Dorian, I have another question for you. Uh, well, you, you want to take yourself, um, your camera off so people can see you? Uh, I, I'm trying to get it, bring it back on. Can you, uh, Sasha, can you bring us back on? Because I, I've, I've tried to, un, I've tried to bring, bring my camp. Now I'm on. Okay. 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 I was here all along. It wasn't just my voice. Okay. But anyway, I was going to just go aside a bit and say, Dorit happens to be a full-time lawyer in intellectual property. 
That's her profession. And in that respect, she's not unlike William Carlos Williams, one of the best poets of the 20th century, who was a full-time pediatrician and a, geri a, gen a general practitioner. And Wallace Stevens who was vice president of an insurance company. So Dorit, how do you fit poetry into a full-time work life? Shh, I screw off during the work day. <laughs> um, you know, if you think of something, you gotta write it, but I, I make up the work later. And you just fiddle a poem in, you start a poem and continue with it bit by bit. Is that it or something like that? Um, if you have an idea um, that you think you might lose, you kind of have to obsess over it and do it right then. But I'm perfectly willing to work another hour later and make up for it. Okay. Well, give us a couple more poems. Give us two more. All right. So these are the ones that won the fancy prize. Um, and the first one is called A Meditation on Purgatory. The dog lies half in the road, half on the curb, like a comma in a sentence you can't take back. A small humped bridge between right now and the second before the speeding car. The intact part of the day receding beneath you like the ground from under a climbing plane. Sometimes past and present stand on either side of a pane of glass and stare at each other. A visit between the life you intended and the one you'll be living after. The unlocked gate, the fleeting lapse of concentration, the momentary flame of anger on the kindling of your never dependable self-control. Sometimes your four red finger marks linger on the face of your child like pox. Sometimes you lift your eyes and let your partner see they're rimmed and empty as old cups. Sometimes when you call, the dog does not come back. This one is, has a nice self-explanatory title. My mother eats ice cream while dying. Bird boned and buckle mouthed, she draws on chocolate clown lips with the spoon, then drops it and digs with her fingers, licking them all the way to the nub of her wrist. Now my mother is palming fudge chunks, clapping them into her face like a kid in a high chair eats Cheerios. Every morning I buy her a new pint in spite of the nurse's disapproval to see her half live mouth cork up in a checkmark smile to watch her screw her eyes shut as if she's blowing out birthday candles, chisel her fingernails under the lip of the cardboard lid and surrounded by a swarm of no and no and never. When she finally pries it off, she says, yes. That is quite a poem. And it must have been extremely painful to write because it is your mother's death. And you watched it with such clarity of vision. But what I really liked is you got the nurse upset because you were giving her ice cream and you weren't supposed to do it, which showed you know that, that you were willing to break the rules for your mother and at the same time pull it in there. So, uh, and uh, it, it also, there's another interesting thing about your poetry that doesn't quite show here because we're hearing it, but, your poems, uh, you do not use capital letters at the beginning of sentences. You do not put in periods. So the reader often doesn't know when one sentence ends and another begins. Uh, and so no punctuation and no capital letters. It's a style consistent on all your poetry. How did you come up with it and, and, and what you're thinking behind it? The first time I really started writing 
um, poems consistently, I was working at a law firm, a lot, lot, lot of hours. And I was proofreading these long, horrible documents and making sure that they were properly punctuated and spelled and perfect. And it felt like a pillow over my face. And so I started writing emails in my private language, which turned out to be no punctuation, no grammar, no capitals, um, just to be a little bit freed from my law firm life. And it became my language of creativity. It was, it was a pure rebellion. And I think it actually works, especially the business of no periods between the sentences, because you have to go back, you're double back sometimes, and the meanings flip on you. Uh, and it's almost like a bit of detective work as you're doing it, but you feel that uh, something has flipped and all of a sudden you flipped on me again. So you get, you get a kind of a multiplicity there. I also wanted to go back to the previous one. First of all, tell us why you came up with this title of, for, for your collection, The Purgatory. A meditation on purgatory. Uh, because everything was between in that uh, poem. The, you know, the, the dog took a long time to get better when we thought he might die. And it was kind of purgatory for him and purgatory for us. And my mom was dying at the same time. And she was in that between fugue state where you know you're going to die, but you're here. Um, so there were a lot of real life purgatories that I was looking at while I was writing those poems. And so that's how it came, came about. Uh, I do recall you were at the arts club the night the dog was hit. Yeah. And, uh, I thought the dog got killed, but it evidently came through. But the idea of catching it on both sides, which again is sustained all the way through. One of the other things I noticed about your poetry is that there's almost no abstractions in it. There's no big thoughts, love, life, death. Those words don't appear. Everything is told in terms of a particular, highly tangible, picturable item or vision. And with, with the sounds clicking and shooting back and forth as, as you're doing it. So it, it's like sustained metaphors. Metaphors and, and similes become they almost personify themselves rather than, you don't even use too much of a like or an as, they just happen to come right in. So those are the things, that's probably what was the, some of the elements that won you the, the prize uh, for, for this collection, because <laughs> that was what was praised a lot about it, and I think is well set for it. So uh, this is a collection, where, where can people get this? Um, I believe it is available free right now if you go to the Harbor Review Press site and you look up uh, Laura Lee Washburn chapbook prize. I think you can just click on it um, and read them if you want to read them. Fine. Okay, give us another two. All right, now this one is uh, Mybridge, Moybridge. I've never been sure how he said it. He was the guy um, who took those first time-lapse pictures of a running horse and in the poem, I somewhat misstate what he photographed because he won the bet by proving that at some point, all four of a horse's feet are off the ground. Um, incidentally, his real name was Ed Muggeridge. Um, then he had kind of a terrible wreck in a carriage because this was in like the 1860s. He got all kinds of brain damage. And he began to decide that he had to get back in touch with ancient England and the Druids. And so he changed his name to Eduard with all these vowels, Moy Bridge, which he just made up. Um, and also his photography studies were interrupted because he spent some time in jail for shooting his wife's lover. So he's a great guy to research if you wanna go down that rabbit hole. This is a poem called Moy Bridge. My husband snores as if he's calling for help in another language or through water. His lips make a sound like he's being defeated in a dream argument. 
but, 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 but. Now his legs are running under the comforter, like those first time-lapse photos that proved that only one leg of a galloping horse touches the ground at any moment. The rest, heavy as it is, hangs suspended between here and there. It's that suspension between here and there that happens a lot in your poems. Things are suspended, but they're there. And they're here at the same time. Uh, all right, give, give us another couple. Okay, so this is... Um, in a crisis, I can be great because I'm not feeling anything, but then how do you get done with not feeling anything? How do you go back to feeling something? So this is kind of an exploration of that problem. And it's called The Snow Is There Faint. The snow is there faint as a word spoken in another room. If I squint, I can make out the flitter of it, white gnats pestering a streetlight. Sometimes the yoga teacher says, breathe in with your soul. And I think, I have no soul. Nothing but my tin can empty self, washed and ready for recycle. Sometimes in church, they preach on the sense of the faithful. And it's a foghorn that's supposed to steer you toward or away from the shoals of God depending. But when I listen inside myself, all I hear is water on rocks. And sometimes at a movie, people near me are crying. And I wonder what happened to them that didn't happen to me. But now I'm thinking maybe it's all like snow falling in a warm climate, that you have to accept how little of it there is, that you have to know where to look. How did you come upon snowflakes as the entry to this idea of a poem? Did the snowflakes come and the poem or was it vice versa as snowflakes? Um, I was looking at the crappy Washington snow and I was wishing there was more of it. Um, and it, you know, as soon as you looked at it, it was gone. Um, and I was like, oh, that's kind of an answer. That's, you know, it's not that I don't feel anything. It's that you got to look for it. And I love the way you talked about yourself, that kind of self-deprecatory, but very funny there. Nothing but my tin can empty self washed and ready for recycle. The ready for recycle brings that up to date. You know, it's, it's so like it's th those little things there give the spin that, that makes the poem come, come a bit more. Uh, and uh, all I hear is water on rocks. You talked about it, listening to yourself. And that at the very end, uh, you have to accept how little of it there is that you have to know where, but you have to know where to look. Okay, uh, and uh, let's go on. You've, for, we've got about two or three more left, so let's-, let's I got two left. Two left. Um, so do you want me to do them as a clump? Uh, well, let's do them individually, and then we can talk about, because we can talk about your poetry and stuff later on, but let's do them, unless, they're, do, unless you see them as related. I don't- No, I think yeah, doing yeah, one yeah, and then the other, because yeah, yeah, they're both a little yeah, bit longer. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is called And Never Stops at All, right? And all the poets should know where I stole that from. Hope is a thing with feathers, right? And the, that I'm ends with, yeah. and never, never stops at all. I sat on the back porch as our handyman's daughter explained the world to me. People keep on pondering upon the problem, she said, when they should be pondering upon the solution. She repeated it, pondering upon, and it made me think of walking on water. Upon, a pond? We were both impressed with the phrase. She was 18, I think, had dropped out of high school, and was in the first flush of love 
with a boy in the grocery store where she worked. My mother had given us lemonade that tasted like the day, sharp, bright, early spring. But what I remember most is how this girl embodied her name, Hope. She shook her sandy bangs out of her eyes with hope, drew hearts on the condensation of her glass with and every time she named the boy, little bells in her voice joined the ice cubes in her glass in a clink of hope, hope, hope. She was pregnant already, although neither of us knew it. The baby was three months old when the boy, speeding and high, crashed their Chevy into a pole and killed them both. Her mother raised the baby, who of course had her own name, but always answered to Hope's daughter. This is kind of an astounding poem because the death comes as an absolute surprise. Uh, you start off as a narrative poem, you're working your way all the way through, you're with us, she's in love, happy little kid. And I thought it was amazing what you did within just those few lines there. She was pregnant, although neither of us knew it. The baby was three months old when the boy, and then everything falls apart, speeding and high, crashed their Chevy into a pole and killed them both. You did it in two lines, total disaster, but it came the same way the shock probably would have come that was there, and then the, the, the carry through as well. Uh, and so I thought that was the kind of the, the, uh, the, the tenderness of it. That, that was coming in and and the war, and also the philosophizing to begin with and to think that these people were just destroyed uh, without any explanation. And it's not even creativity because that's exactly what happened. Um, it, it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot of a day that I really remember. And you described yourself in uh, at another, when Grace Cavalieri interviewed you, I believe you described yourself as being a camera or it was yeah. looking at. And I, I, I also looked at that the same way. I, I, I'm thinking at the poetry as I see what you do is you are an observer. You look and then you lay it out. But you don't. And, and what you basically observe are ironies consistent ironies of the experience of life. Life itself is one huge irony, but you don't interpret the irony. You leave it right in front of people to decide for themselves what it is, but, but you have pulled it out. You've made the photograph or you pulled the item in the same way here, the irony here, you let me as the reader and the other readers decide, oh my God, look what happened at all those things and why should life happen this way? Uh, I think the next poem really illustrates that. So let's go into that. All right, now this is one of those poems where you like look in Poetry Magazine and you go, I'm not gonna read that because it's long and it's got section numbers. So two things, it's only two pages you'll live and I will not read the number. I don't like it, I think it drops you out of the poem. So I'm just gonna pause in between sections. This is called Snake. Twice, we found a black snake, once curled under a table, the second time draped over the front door like swag from a funeral parade. Both times, we were all oddly still, as if we froze him as much as he froze us. The day suspended while all of us stared and didn't decide. The times my husband announced that he was leaving me, he said, one, he was going to be a plumber and live in a trailer in Waldorf. Two, he was going to kill himself. Three, he was going to train horses and live in Ocala, Florida. And four, he planned to travel the country in a VW van. My husband did not leave me. Eventually, my husband picked up the indoor snake with barbecue tongs and tossed it outside. And we called him, my husband, Marlon Perkins, and then Stan, because Stan did all the work. 
Of course, the girls called him Hero Daddy. Sometimes I think I see a tail disappearing under the fence, as if someone has opened a backwards door and instead of light escaping, a spill of liquid dark is being sucked in or down. Sometimes when I walk into the bedroom, my husband quickly takes the ad for the VW bus off the computer screen. Sometimes he leaves it there. But then the other night he made me chicken with beurre blanc and drizzled the sauce in beautiful sidewinder curves. Then today, I lifted the front door towel, the one we leave for the dog's paws, and under it were black coils, so neat, I thought somebody must have ordered computer cable. And then I saw the eyes. It was exactly as if I had walked into the wrong room or woken someone from sleep both of us embarrassed, both of us waiting for the other to make a move. And I said, excuse me, and I replaced the folded towel. Thank you for listening, everybody. <laughs> On this one, where I don't want to set some, some uh, observations of myself. The reason why I said that this kind of sums you up, I think the snake, you stare at it, you find it. Uh, it, it shouldn't be there, but you don't know what to do about it. At the very ending, I said, excuse me, and I replaced the folded towel. Uh, that's what you do to your readers. You, you put the snake in front of it. And, and even up in earlier at, uh, up the poem, it says, uh, uh, it, it, he froze the day suspended while all of us stared and didn't decide. And you're not going to decide either again. Uh, and you go further along there where, where it happens, uh, because that you, you're sort of thrown right there. And of course, the, the snake, you, you apologize for the snake, but you walk away. And that's exactly sort of, I think, the thing that makes the poems interesting. You brought it out. Now, this snake, was it a real snake again in your house? Um, there were two snakes and we did find them. Uh, but the whole poem is thinking about what does it mean to leave well enough alone? Uh, when do you do it with an animal? When do you do it with a person? When is it better to shut up? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like the Irish have this phrase, pass no remarks. <laughs> that could be something like it as well. Uh, I have a couple of other broader questions and we invite everyone else now to bring questions as well. But one of these is that uh, as a lawyer, you haven't written poetry all your life. When did you begin, where and why? Um, I wrote a really, really terrible poem in the seventh grade magazine, and I hope all copies have now been destroyed. Um, and then I tried again at the law firm because I was so miserable. And I remember the first line of this poem was, I wrote, I am a surfer on a tidal wave. Uh, which was another bad poem, which has been appropriately destroyed. But I just, things felt so out of control. There was so much work and I was so unhappy. And I was just like, when is this wave going to break on me? Um, so yeah, I just was writing stuff because there was no one to say it to. And, uh, but then in other words, you, when did you actually begin writing poetry? How far, the, you said your children are already grown or... I started trying when Katie was four, and I was very lucky. I think Geraldine Connolly may be on this, uh, this call. Um, so I was lucky enough to go to the Writers' Center and to run into Jerry Connolly, and she said, maybe you can actually be a poet. And she kind of told me how to revise so that a lot of times I would just write it. And if it was bad, I was painted into a corner and I couldn't fix it. So she kind of put me on the path to being able to fix it. Um, and then because I'm just a terrible careerist, I told myself I'm gonna mail out poems um, and I'm gonna get 10 acceptances anywhere. So I got 10 acceptances anywhere. And then I said, okay, we can't aim for the bottom anymore. I got to get 10 acceptances someplace good. So 
I did that. I forced myself. And then I said, okay, I got to put this together and make a book and I got to get someone to accept the book. So by my horrible type A careerism, I have pushed myself to wherever it is I am now. Okay. Uh, Sasha, uh, do we have any questions coming in from people at this point? We, hi there. Uh, we do have one question from um, our friend Charles um, Parsons. Um, he did say in the chat, aside from being a lawyer, I understand you have two daughters. They're fairly, de that's fairly demanding. How old are they? So how old are your daughters, Dorit? <laughs> uh, 26 and 22 now. So it's easier now. <laughs> I have one other question. This one I, I did steal from Grace Cavalieri because I think it was interesting, but she said, tell me some of the adjectives it takes to be a poet. God, I don't even remember her asking me that. Um, but in other words, what, what are the things that make, make poets poets or, or what makes poetry poetry? I think you should be a good observer. I think you should have a really good ability to cut your pomposity. Um, after you write some florid thing, you need to go, well, nobody wants to read that rant. Um, and look for the parts that somebody would be interested in and get rid of the rest of the garbage. So those are the things that, they're the main things that, that kind of pull there. Yeah. Hey, Dord, this is Sasha again. Um, Bill has a question uh -huh. for you, uh, or Bill Turner. Um, who are your favorite poets and how have they influenced you? Um, I guess currently, if you're asking now, um, Ilya Kaminsky with Deaf Republic is the Darwinian advance. He has moved poetry so far forward with that book that, you know, the rest of us are analog. Um, I love Bob Hickok. I think calling him back from layoff might be the perfect poem written in the English language because of the way it captures how the mind moves, uh, those people's subconscious while they're having this conversation. Uh, Jill McDonough um, for being, again, a very real observer with no fat in her poems. I will say that, and everyone will hate me for this, I, the po poem I read that made me want to be a poet was by Charles Bukowski, uh, because he has that poem where his father beats him up and then he goes and he's clean in the garage and he beats the hell out of a spider with a broom. And I was like, you can write about abuse. That was revelation number one. And two, I'm not alone. So a lot of people don't like Yukowski, but that was very important to me. Would you tell us also about the Wicked Woman Prize? What, what, what's the focus of the... Um, for anyone who's a poet, I would love to see your manuscript. It's in my mother's honor. It's open from Labor Day till New Year's every year. This year, we are very fortunate that Kim Roberts is going to be our judge. Nancy Naomi Carlson, uh, Rose Solari, and Catherine Young have all done it in the past and were wonderful uh, for writing by or about women. There is very little... Very few prizes are just for women and spotlighting women. Uh, so I do hope we'll see your full-length manuscripts. Uh, for more information, look at Brickhouse Books webpage. And when does it come out and when are the submissions like? Um, it, it opens Labor Day and it closes on New Year's every year. Hi, this is Sasha. Once again, I have one more question in the chat um, from Donald. He asked, how long does it take to revise a poem? Forever. <laughs> um, it, I'm never happy. Um, I considered changing some words today, but I didn't want to mess up Adam. Um, so I left it. What did um, you consider changing? What poem? Um, I realized that if you're not looking at the quote marks in higher mathematics, I need he said and she said so that you know who's speaking. That's small. Um, you can see it visually, but you, it was hard to hear. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's all the questions I have in the chat. Um, if you have no other questions, Michael, do you want to tell them about um, yes, the I, Arts Club? Yeah, uh, basically, I'd like to say that, uh, first of all, uh, weekly, we put out a posting, new events at the Arts Club, and you can see what we're listing. Uh, and at the very top of the screen, it says, go to our video. And in there, you can see the video of uh, several interviews that Dorit has conducted with poets. Uh, but we also have some gorgeous musical things with jazz with, by, by Bernard Thompson. And we have, uh, we have uh, now we're showing the gallery shows as well that we, we have, uh, their, their visuals. Uh, so it's, it's worth looking at and you can, uh, it's all on YouTube and you can, and this, this, uh, this uh, interview and, and reading will also be up there in a week or two. Uh, so please keep us in mind there. And we are hoping within the next month or two to open more and more uh, the Arts Club and have people come live. And uh, we may try uh, combinations of Zoom and real life on some of these as well. So we're happy to have you. And we want to thank Sasha again, and especially Adam, our interpreter. Both of those have given great color to this event. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Michael. I would like to say at this point in our program, we always invite our folks to turn on their cameras because we love to see your beautiful faces and say thank you for coming and thank you for um, coming out to support Dort and her reading. And it's always great to see our old friends and new friends. And oh, I see Jeffrey Henry singing in front of, oh my gosh, I know that painting. <laughs> you want me to put it on gallery? Yeah, and you're welcome to unmute. And, please and please yell unmute, at me now. yes, and just say hello. <laughs> we like to have Thanks everybody waving. I love you, Dorit. <laughs> Good job, Dorit. <laughs> yeah, great. Oh, excellent. Bravo, oh, viva la Dorit. Dorit. Uh, <laughs> just there too, yes. Good. I love seeing everybody's living rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such well, a <laughs> Well done, Dorit. I'll see you Monday. In the flesh. <laughs> and she usually rains, has are it. we still doing it uh yes okay great show really wonderful and dora usually has a parrot she turned off the parrot or something. <laughs> it's a that, that's a good deal, trick but yeah, yeah i covered him so that everyone wouldn't hear that hi barbara hi jenny i can't see all the squares because there's too many people but yeah so we can see your poems uh at the Harvard um, Review, Poetry Review. Under Harbor the Press, five. I think. Harbor. Oh, Harbor. Harbor. Is it Harbor Press Review? Is that it, Dorit? I it, think it's Harbor Review. Okay, let me. I did not do the link, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can find the link really quickly for those Harbor Review. <laughs> yeah. If you do, it's worth going to read them as well, because then you can see what we're talking about and what she does with the, with, I, I think the actual absence of capitals works fine. It was quite interesting, but especially I think the, the choice of where the, the lines break, of course, are always critical in poetry, but the fact that you have no warnings at all with, with punctuation is a kind of a tease. It's a, it works very nicely, really. But it's you said, Dart. You were even trying to trying to master that a bit more. You know, trying to. Think. Yeah, I finally read the book about line breaks that Catherine had been telling me to read. So I did do it, and I'm trying to get better. Um, I I had this like late boozy discussion at a law firm once where we talked about every word as like a place in the molecular structure of the poem, and so moving them around, you know, can change the compound. It changes what comes out as the end product. So I fiddle with that a lot. So, um, so I just had one question for someone from Barbara who said who who missed the first half hour. Um, who, the, this was recorded, Barbara, and we will be posting this next week since Dort is so special to us. I'll make sure this gets out expedited. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Higher mathematics and purgatory were tremendous. Thank you. Who's yelling? Ken. <laughs> That's Ken. Yes. That's your, <laughs> that your fan club, I think. Yes. Um, I did, you. for those on the call, I just put the Harbor Review um, link to Meditation and Purgatory in the chat. So if you want to capture that. Um, and it has beautiful artwork. That's the part you're missing. Um, Minas Consulis, who some of you know, he's a Baltimore artist who used to have the gallery Minas that we all used to give our readings at. 
um, he had this wonderful um, kind of Van Gogh thing of daisies. And when I saw it, I was like, pushing up daisies, a book called Meditation on Purgatory must need pushing up daisies for the cover. So I, I persuaded him to let me use his painting for my cover. And included on the back of it is uh, are this, uh, stunning, stunning reviews of, of the quality of the work that really we, we sort of indi in, indirectly touched on, but it's the, the out, really outstanding stuff that they're saying there. I, I would blush like hell if I were the author. <laughs> and you can capture that. I'm blushing. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to say um, on my part, thank you, everybody, for coming out to this evening. We really enjoyed you being on with us, and, and we hope to see you again at the next events. Please go to artsclubofwashington.org and sign up for the newsletter to make sure you, you um, get the weekly um, the weekly updates of what's going on. We have so many things happening. As you said, as Michael said, we will be opening up more and more, so we look forward to that. But I'd like to say before we leave the call that it's a wrap. We hope everybody has a wonderful and safe evening and a lovely, safe weekend. Enjoy this, this springy slash fallish weather that we're having in Washington, D.C. right now. And watch out for those cicadas. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.